Welcome back to our channel. In this video, real people open up about their most disturbing, scary, and creepy experiences. Join us as we explore the depths of these true stories, and don't forget to subscribe if you enjoy the video. I grew up in a small town in Florida. It's so small that the population, probably, nearly doubles during snowbird season, when old people from up north move down for the winter. It is extremely dark at night, and there usually aren't many cars on the road after 9.30 or 10 p.m. When I was 16, I had a boyfriend who lived across town in a lower income area. I would usually visit him on Friday and Saturday nights because he didn't have a license yet. It was probably a good 15 minute drive from his house to mine. One Saturday night, when I was leaving at 10 or 10.30 maybe, I noticed a pickup truck pass me as I turned off of the street. It was kind of uncommon to see another car on the road that time of night, because, seriously, it's a small town. But I didn't really think anything of it. After a while, I noticed that the truck seemed to be going in the same direction as me. It was going slow, and for some reason it seemed like the driver was watching where I was going. Which kind of creeped me out. But I figured I was being ridiculous and decided to just pass the truck. As I passed, I looked over, and the middle-aged man driving the truck started me down, his face was very intense. It was an incredibly scary look for a 16-year-old girl to see while alone at night. There was just something so weird about it. That prompted me to call my dad and keep him on the phone with me as I continued to drive home. Let me say, I can't imagine that many people go from that side of town to where my parents lived at that time of night, and he was still behind me when I turned into my neighborhood. As I slowed down, I noticed that the truck was stopped on the main road, within sight of where I was going. I can't remember if he ever turned in or not, because at that point I was in a panic and sped to my parents' house, where my dad was waiting for me outside in the driveway. I was absolutely terrified of bodies of water when I was little. I wailed my throat sore when anyone tried to bathe me, would never go to pool parties, and cried for days if I ever even saw a puddle. No one acted like they knew why, no matter how many times I pleaded with them to tell me. My 17th birthday comes, and a friend invites me to a party at their apartment. We are right next to a pool, and I am a little wary. A new friend shoves me into the pool, and I lose it. I'm crying, screaming, hyperventilating, and even almost pissing myself. Boyfriend saves me, new friend is apologizing out of her ass. I go home. I'm sitting with my foster dad, and he's hugging me. I'm just enjoying being on land and breathing. After a while, he tells me he has something to tell me. You were put into foster care because your mother tried to kill you. She filled a bathtub with water and held you under until your father found her. When they asked her why, she said it was because she didn't like the way you looked at your father. She said you were looking at her with the same eyes when she held you under. My birth mother tried to drown me when I was an infant because she was jealous of my love for my birth father, and because of it, I've been scared of water my whole life. I can't even describe the chills I got when he told me that. This happened in my senior year of college, Christmas break 2006. I worked for a professor who asked me to house slash dog sit for him while he was out of town to see the bowl game that we were in. He was gone for three days and had a huge piece of land in the middle of nowhere. At the time, I invited my girlfriend. He had horses for fishing and a gator to ride around on, etc. So the first two nights went down with no incident, but the last night, his little foofy dog was having a fit. She keeps barking at the back door. At first, we blow it off but we decide to lock the dog inside in case of a coyote or something. After a while, we start to get a little creeped out. I keep saying it's probably an animal, and we'll be fine. My girlfriend, not too bright, wants to go investigate to see what's outside, so I lock the door behind her, he he, just kidding. She goes outside and says she saw something small and gray, probably a coyote, and it ran off. So, just an animal, no worries. But by this time, we're pretty spooked. The dog now starts barking at the window on the other side of the house, we're still trying to ignore it, but a little worried. We decide to get into bed. An awkward silence. Then I hear it. It sounds like a young girl singing a soft, eerie lullaby. I don't say anything, hoping that my mind is playing tricks on me. My GF says, let's get out of here. I say, why? And she says, you didn't hear that little girl singing? Okay, let's get out, and we got the fuck out. I even called someone to talk to me while we walked out to my car. The next morning, I went to clean up the house and such. Most scared I've ever been. Ever. To start, I just want to say that I've never been the type of person who gets caught up in the idea of paranormal activities or ghost stories. To me, even at a young age, 
those types of stories just seemed completely unbelievable, and I could never take them seriously. With that being said, what I am about to post is something that happened to me a few years ago that pretty much changed all of that. It's not an overly scary story, but I think the simplicity of it is what creeped me out as much as it did. My mom was in the real estate business, which often required her to check out houses on her own before taking customers with her. She would usually just do this on her own, but every once in a while, she would take me. Well, this house comes on the market that many other agents apparently say is haunted and my mom figured she'd take me along. To be honest, the house was pretty creepy, completely covered in vines, but whatever, it's an old house, not really a big deal or out of the ordinary. We go in and look around the first floor, and for the most part, it seems like most houses she takes me into are still furnished and have that smell of a house that has been empty for a while. The first thing that struck me as a little bit odd was that they had one of those old-style box TVs, and it was playing some old black and white World War II documentary, and it just made the house seem really old and gloomy. We eventually made our way upstairs to look at the bedrooms. The second floor was set up so that there was one long hallway with two or three doors staggered down its length. The first room was normal enough, but as we got to the second room, we saw it was completely full of stuffed animals, not the toys, but a whole room dedicated to real stuffed animals. Even though I thought that was pretty strange, the room was fine. Besides that, it was pretty neat and nothing out of place. Wanting to get out of the room, we went down the hallway to check out the final bedroom, which again was fine. We're on our way downstairs, and for some reason, as we pass the second room, I look back in and immediately stop in my tracks because there is now a chair directly in the center of the room. We were both positive it wasn't there before since we would have literally walked into it when we were in the room before. But nonetheless, there it is, sitting directly in the middle of the room, like it was meant to be there. Obviously, we got out of the house pretty quickly after seeing that. It was something so simple, but what really got me was that there was no explanation for it. We were the only two in the house, and neither of us went off on our own to check out a room without the other. So how the hell does a chair randomly move in arguably the weirdest room in the entire house? I consider myself a pretty logical person, and the fact that I can't think of a single explanation for what happened is why thinking about that house still bothers me so many years later. On a side note, in the few years since we looked at the house, it has sold five or six times, with almost all the homeowners saying that strange things would happen when they were in the house, like someone didn't want them living there. When I was about 12, we lived in a pretty big house that had so much room that we didn't know what to do with it. We had a security system that would beep every time someone opened a door or window. I was the only one at home. I was sitting at the table in the kitchen, which was an island that had a sink attached to it. I was just getting started on my homework when I heard our big stained wood door with metal handles fly open and the security system beep. I thought cool, mom's home. I heard rapid footsteps, like someone was running towards me. I saw a dark shadow with a grin that could scare the shite out of anyone on its face, running directly towards me. I had no time to react, I was in complete shock. At the last second, it changed course and ran straight into my parents' room. Then I heard the screams. Blood-curdling screams that pierced my eardrums. Then I heard glass breaking and things being thrown onto the floor. It stopped. It came back out of the room, stopped directly in front of me, and just stared for a good five seconds. It smiled. It then walked down the hallway out of the open door, never to be seen again. I called my parents, and they rushed home from the store. They checked their room and comforted me. There was a broken vase on the floor, the sink was on, there was a crack in the shower wall, and various soaps and lotions were on the floor. I have never let my parents leave without me to go anywhere from that day on. When I was about 13, my grandparents owned a house on the waterfront. The property was on a heavily wooded peninsula, and because my grandparents lived in Florida half of the year, they allowed their, obviously grown, children to use the house as a sort of vacation home. The woods were littered with sizable streams that emptied out into the larger body of water that the house faced, and some of these streams were deep enough in places so as to provide swimming holes relatively deep pockets of slow-moving water that were often close to the stream bank. One of my favorite such holes was about 12 to 15 feet deep and had fairly cloudy visibility if you went any deeper than 3 feet under the surface. These measurements are probably off, it was at least a decade ago that this happened, and everything seems bigger when you are a child. And when you're terrified, being a kid, I didn't think of the stupidity of swimming in such a spot. It was made even more awesome by a long rope somebody had tied around a thick tree limb, you would swing on the rope, and once you got high enough, you'd let go and drop down into the water below. Once, when my parents were taking a nap, I got it into my head that it would be a great time to go swimming. Alone. Without supervision. When I arrived at the hole, 
I decided to challenge myself and see if I could reach the bottom. I pulled the rope back as far away from the edge of the water as I could until I was standing on my tiptoes. Holding the rope, I ran full speed until I was airborne, then dropped into the water. Unbelievably, and I use that term loosely, I sank to the bottom. Satisfied with this result, I pushed off the stream bed, expecting to be propelled back to the top. Instead, I went a few inches and was abruptly jerked back. Confused, I tried again, and again, I went nowhere. Panicking, I realized that my swimming trunks had gotten snagged on a submerged stump or log, but in my mind, some evil creature had grabbed hold of me. I desperately struggled to get free. This is the part that I remember most, my vision started to darken around the periphery, tunnel vision, if you will. Bright spots of light were flashing in the little window of sight I still had. The pain in my oxygen-deprived lungs felt like they were on fire. I could actually feel myself starting to pass out, I was losing muscle control, and my eyes were starting to roll back in my head. My limbs felt so heavy, and I was losing the will to struggle. Then it happened, somebody appeared through the murky water and freed my shorts from the stump. They grabbed a hold of me and carried me up to the surface. Then they were gone. There was no trace of them. A huge tear in one of the legs of my bathing suit was the only physical evidence of my ordeal. Thinking back, I'm fairly certain that this savior entity was a product of my oxygen-deprived brain. What I believe actually happened was the result of an intense effort by my mind to tell me to save itself. Some part of me must have had the wherewithal to make a final, desperate struggle that, luckily, ripped my shorts and freed me. That same part of me must have made some sort of effort to swim to the surface as well, though I suppose it's possible that my body's natural buoyancy had something to do with that. I was young, and I'd like to say that it was just a kid's mistake, but I could just be stupid. I got a new bike and was excited to ride it, but I wasn't allowed to go off my street. So, of course, I did as soon as my parents' backs were turned. I was old enough to know that what I was doing was wrong, but I didn't really care. So I'm in a nearby neighborhood, minding my own business, when a guy rolls up in a van and asks if I need a ride. I say no, but he continues to insist or ask questions. The entire exchange feels off, so I quickly turn around and race home. Halfway down the street, I realize the guy is actually banging a U-turn and coming around. Oh, hell no. I race across a busy street, nearly getting hit, and instead of going the extra bit to my neighborhood, I just speed down the street behind my own street and go to my neighbor's house, who lives behind me, and ditch my bike. They have a huge yard, and I can easily climb their small fence, reach over the top of my own larger fence, and drop into my backyard. I quickly do so, and once inside the safety of my backyard, I look out one of the holes in the wood fence, and I see the van drive by slowly on my neighbor's street. The man obviously sees my bike in the yard and thinks that it must be my house as he waits for a bit before quickly driving away. Once he was gone, I started crying, but I was too scared to go get my bike back or even go biking again after my neighbor kindly brought it back to me. I didn't even tell my parents because I was sure I'd get in trouble for going off the street. It seems stupid of me not to tell them now, but may, kid logic. It was 2002, and I was hitchhiking around the US. I was on my way to a rainbow gathering in the Mark Twain National Forest just outside of Ironton, Missouri. It was about 11 p.m. when we made it to the state road that led into the forest. It was too dark to see the discreetly stacked stone kerns that led us to the seed camp location, so we decided to pull it over on the side of the road and wait until morning. All night, we heard what sounded like children playing. There are lots of kids. Like an entire playground's worth. Except we were miles from the nearest public road, out in the middle of BLM land, and the noises continued on throughout the entire night. The next morning, we found the seed camp location and settled in. At the height of the gathering, there were maybe 150 people there, but in the seed camp stage, there were maybe a dozen or so of us who got there early to set up the site. A few of us went wandering around in the hills looking for firewood and perhaps a fresh spring to get water from. We came across an old foundation for a house out in the middle of the woods. The house that stood on it must have been gone for quite some time because there were decent-sized trees growing where it once stood. There were a few pieces of rotted out boards scattered about, as well as some rusted nails and other metal bits that must have served some integral function for the home. We figured there might be some cool old junk lying around, so we looked closer. We found a kid's shoe, half-rotten, on the forest floor. Then we found another. And another. And another. And then we found half-decreasing garbage bags full of them. Hundreds of kids' shoes of all styles, from old-timey dress shoes to those jelly shoes from the 80s. Some looked relatively new, and some looked like they'd been out there for decades. Scattered within a 25-foot radius of this old foundation. Oddly enough, there wasn't any other stuff out there. 
No old refrigerator, or maybe some junk appliances, tools, or whatnot. Just kids' shoes. Back then, when I was in 7th grade, my dad couldn't pick me up from school with his car, so my mom usually walked all the way to my school, picked me up, and walked back home with me. One day, I felt ready enough to do the walk alone. I was about 10 minutes from home when this white truck pulled up next to me and called me over, asking for help. Being stupid, I approached him. I was naive and fairly innocent, but I noticed something wasn't right. His pants were unzipped, and his flaccid-looking donger was hanging out, with some sticky goo around it. I just decided not to look at it and help this guy out as quickly as possible. He wanted to know where some street was, but I was new here, so I told him I didn't really know. All I could give him was a direction to Walmart, and maybe he could find his way there. So he asked me to come in his van and show me where Walmart was, but I didn't want to. I told him I'd give him a map. So he takes out some paper and pencil and tells me to draw. He grabs my hand and makes me touch his thing, my skin crawls just remembering, and the sticky goo gets all over my hand. He kept doing it over and over, and finally I managed to take my hand away and run. I started crying, then I saw his truck pull up again just ahead of me, and he turned off his car. I panicked. I ran back and stood just outside a packed Chinese restaurant and started crying hysterically. I remember wildly thinking, do I go inside? But I don't have money, what if they ask me what I want to order? So I just stayed at the door for a while, maybe an hour or so, then I took a peek to make sure he was gone before I continued on home. When I arrived at the house, my mom was already on her way out with a worried expression on her face. She saw my tear-stricken face and asked what was wrong. I was so embarrassed and didn't want to tell her outside, so I just shook my head and told her I'd let her know later. I made sure to wash my hand with a ton of soap and rub alcohol on it. I remember making a pact to never use that hand again. When I told her what happened, my mother was so pissed off and asked me if I remember the license plate, what he looked like, etc., but I didn't remember. She then told me she just had this gut feeling something was terribly wrong before I even got home. I remember asking her not to tell my dad or my sister because that was so embarrassing, like it was my fault. I don't even know why I thought that way. I always think it's so strange when victims blame themselves or are embarrassed by what happened, but then I remember my own story, and then I kind of understand, even though I know it doesn't make sense. I'm sure a ton of people have a story about this day, but here's mine. So it's September 11, 2001. I was in fourth grade, and it was one week before my birthday, so I was pretty excited, as any soon-to-be nine-year-old would be. My teacher gets a call around 9 a.m. and tells me I'm being called to the main office. I'm kind of confused but blissfully oblivious until I get there. My mother was on the brink of tears, and she had my older brother and my six-month-old baby brother with her, and the only thing she could say was something terrible happened. On the way home, she and my brother filled me in and told me about the attack on the WTC. She also mentioned that she couldn't get in contact with my father, a 20-year-old NY police officer. I got home and the news was on, and I guess the whole situation hadn't quite settled in yet, because I remember not exactly being panicked or upset. I was more concerned about my mother. A few hours later, my mother finally gets in contact with my father, and he's completely okay. I found out later that he was supposed to have been in the second tower helping evacuate when it collapsed, but because the officer before him came back late from his shift, my father didn't get there when he was scheduled to and was about two blocks away when the tower came down. If that other officer had ended his shift on time, my father would have been buried in the debris. I guess I never really considered that to be scary until years later, when I realized that without that unbelievably lucky break, my mother would have been widowed with three kids. The whole incident scarred my father too, and he retired a year or two later. I once had a teddy named Spock, his ears were pointy, we were inseparable. I'm guessing I gave him an age of three quarters. I loved that bear, once, my elder brother snatched a spook from me and repeatedly punched him. I remember bursting into tears. I laugh about that now. Something I will never laugh about happened to Spook, maybe I was 8 at the time, but I'm not sure. My age is probably the only part I am unsure of. Everything else that I'm going to tell you happened, and if you don't believe it, then that's okay, I doubt I would either. I went to bed with my teddy, as per my usual routine. I woke up startled but foggy, taking a second or two to remember where I was, what night it was, etc. Immediately, I noticed Spock missing. I woke up enough to not shrug this off and resume an unfinished dream. So I scanned my room. Not there. Maybe my mom took him when I was asleep to put him through the wash? I can't remember exactly what I thought, but only that I needed him back. I left my room and marched to my mom's to retrieve my believed bear. Only mom was in her room. Strange. I knew it was late, even in the middle of the night. 
She wouldn't be in my brother's room, would she? I checked doing that thing of turning on every available light as I progressed through the house. No one was in my brother's room. Genuinely worried now, I marched slowly downstairs, trying to manufacture anger at my mom and brother for staying up late downstairs and falling asleep and for scaring me. They weren't there. I was young, but I knew my mom well enough to know she would never leave me home alone. My brother may play a trick on me, but not my loving mom. I'd check the whole house. The whole deathly quiet house. What do you do when you can't escape that level of fear? I had nowhere else to check, nowhere to go. Then I heard a noise from the basement. I'd forgotten about the basement. This knowledge terrified and soothed me in equal measure. They must be down there, I don't know why, but they must. This way of thinking was to fortify me for the last room check. A room I hated. I approached the basement door and realized it was a slightly open jar. Now, up to this point, I've kept silent, I don't know why. Maybe an intuition. But I pressed open that door and screamed, literally screamed, with everything I had, Muam. No answer. I went down a couple of steps just to reach the light switch. I found Spock. I could see his lower half sticking out from behind a tool kit. It was as if I were being beckoned into the basement to retrieve him. No, thanks. I ran back to my room and hid under the bed. My mom woke me the next morning by calling breakfast from downstairs. So it had been a dream. But why did I wake up under the bed? Am I a sleepwalker now? Cool. But Spock was missing, and at breakfast, my mom and brother asked me why all the lights were on in the house when they got up. My brother said if it was me, then I was in trouble. I asked them about leaving the house, but they didn't know what I was talking about. Later, I told mom what happened, and she was genuinely concerned. She looked for Spock everywhere, including the basement, but he was never seen again. I'm a native, Kiowa tribe. Whether this has any bearing on the occurrence that I'm about to describe, I don't know, it's merely for descriptive purposes. In any case, I grew up in a housing addition where most of the Kiowas in my hometown have lived since the addition was built. There were several other kids my age who lived there too. It consists of three streets connected by two streets on either side. My grandma lives on one of the corners at the end of the middle street. The street that connects all three main streets is bordered by a standard-sized farmer's barbed wire fence, with farmer's properties on the other side. There's a street lamp on the corner just outside my grandma's house. One night, when I was about 15 or so, I was out under that lamp with two friends talking, joking, and whatnot. Suddenly, I notice an animal-like figure sitting by the fence in the corner where the other main street starts. There's a street lamp there as well, but the figure was sitting in a spot that was obscured by shadows caused by a couple large trees with overhanging branches. It is facing away from the fence, is very still, and makes no sound. It appears to be all black, sits on its hind legs like a canine, and I can clearly see its eyes emitting a soft, yellow glow. I point it out to my friends and ask, what is that? They turn to look, and we all stare, trying to make sense of it. It looks straight at us for a few seconds that seem like eternity, then in one fluid motion, turning while it jumps over the fence, a good five feet high, it disappears into the darkness, making no sound, though there was only tall grass and fallen leaves and branches on the other side of the fence. Needless to say, we noped right out of there to my friend's grandma's house on the street on the far end of where we saw the creature, my family was at a powwow, so nobody was at my grandma's house, and there was no way I was staying there alone after that. We told my friend's grandma what we saw, and she told us there are many mysterious things in the dark in the area of Oklahoma I come from, deep southwest, and to just be glad that it wasn't malignant. There are many strange things that happen out there. I've grown up with boatloads of stories from aunts, uncles, grandparents, etc. I don't think I want to know what it was. Back in late 2002 or early 2003, I lived on an isolated road heading out to the middle of nowhere. A narrow road with no side streets, houses after the first few miles, and no streetlights. Accidents were common since people loved to race down this road. One night I was home alone with my ex when we heard another car crash. This one sounded weird, like lots of cars wrecking. So we grab our shoes and run down the road, and there is literally debris everywhere. A pickup truck had taken the turn too hard and ejected all three passengers. The multiple crashes we heard were the truck crashing to the ground after each rotation. When we got to the road, the truck was all smashed up, but somehow its engine was revving, and there was smoke everywhere as if it were on fire. All the car parts and people were lying on the road. It was dark, so it was really hard to see, but I could see the outlines of a man just sitting in the middle of the road, making this horrible noise. His friend was lying there dead, so I don't know if he was screaming in pain, shock, or what, but it's a sound you never forget. By that time, cops had shown up and used their spotlights on the scene, which made it worse. 
my mind won't recall a single image from that moment, as weird as that sounds. I can remember the guy on the road, and though I can't see his friend, I want how he's next to him. I know when all the spotlights go on the road, it's a mess, but that's all I remember seeing. What I know happened is that when the guys were ejected, their bodies were torn apart. So much so that police were walking around with body bags after the victims had long since been driven off. I know the scene was so bloody that the road and the pull-off in front of our driveway were stained with blood for days. And the neighbor, who told me, calmly stepped over the remains I noticed next to me when the lights went on. But I don't recall any of it. The only other thing I remember from that night is the life flight helicopter circling overhead and all the trees moving because it was so low. That alone is an eerie experience. Out of three men, two died on the scene. One lived and fled the country, they were migrant workers, probably my worst memory. When I lived with my parents, I had come home after spending the Saturday at a friend's. To my surprise, the house was quiet. My parents were supposed to be there, but no one responded when I said hello. I walk around and check the living room and the bedrooms, then decide to check the kitchen for a note or something, but instead I find blood everywhere. It was clear that something very bad had happened, and I got this ill feeling. There was blood all over the sink, the countertop, and the floors, just everywhere, so I went to grab the phone, but it too was covered in blood. As I stood there frozen in fear, staring at the blood spattered on the wall by the phone, it dawned on me that whoever did this could still be in the house. My eyes then follow the blood down the wall to the floor, where I see it trailing toward the doors to the garage in the basement. I immediately darted out the front door, screaming for help, and saw a cop car pull into the driveway, following my mom's car. My mom jumps out of the car covered in blood and yells, we have to find dad's finger. I soon find some relief in discovering that my parents are alive and well and that my father had just lost his finger while using the chipper or shredder in the backyard. Along with the police, my mom and I look through the wood chip pile for dad's finger, but to no avail, so to this day he is one less digit. The day after the accident, I was told to put the chipper slash shredder away and move the pile, so I did, and I ended up finding dad's finger. It was white and fleshy, almost fake looking, but it was real. I didn't want to touch it, so I picked it up with two sticks and brought it in to my father, who cried at its belated discovery. We buried it in the backyard later that day, next to our old dog. This will get buried, but oh well. When I was about four, my dad was a mechanic and found a little ugly chihuahua in a junkyard. He brought him home, and my parents were going to take him to a shelter, but I begged and begged to keep him. I even swore I'd watch him since we lived in the middle of nowhere in the panhandle of Texas. Anyway, they let me keep him, mainly, I think, because they didn't think he'd survive. Fast forward five years, and the dog grows up to be the most beautiful, big dog you ever saw, named Ernie after Sesame Street. By this point, I was allowed to drive a golf cart to my grandparents' house, about two miles away after school. The distance was pretty much just a big field with a few fences. One day, the battery went dead in the golf cart halfway there. Ernie had followed me like always, and we started making the difference. All of a sudden, Ernie turns towards me and starts growling. This was a massive dog, and I was terrified. I just saw Old Yell too and was convinced that he had rabies. I tried to run past him, and he jumped on me before I made two steps. He knocked me down. He stopped growling and just stood on top of me for a minute. When he got off, I started running towards my house. He just stayed there, growling at something imaginary. I told my dad, and he grabbed his gun, presumably to kill Ernie, and I was freaking out. Like an hour later, I heard a gunshot. Imagine my surprise when my dad and Ernie came back unharmed. Apparently, there had been a nest of huge rattlesnakes in the ditch ahead of me, and Ernie had kept me from walking right through it. I had never noticed because I usually drove over the other side, where the trail was. According to my very freaked out dad, there was no way I would have missed them. Ernie must have heard them and saved me. I was 16 and woke up in the middle of the night to see my clothes being rustled about in my doorway. After washing my clothes, I like to hang them dry on my door frame, I notice some really grey, veiny looking legs, and then I see these really long, pointed sticks moving through my clothes. It took me a second, but my sleepy eyes adjusted to see one of the most grotesque demon looking motherfuckers I have ever seen. He was extremely skinny and had a distended stomach, his skin was grey and veiny, and those long sticks were his fingers. His chin was long, his eyes had no lids on them, and they were unusually big. His tiny mouth was in a pucker and moved like he was eating an imaginary lollipop, his hunchback looked as though it tore out of the strange hospital gown he was wearing. He just stared at me, and I tried to scream at my grandmother, who was sharing a room with me for the weekend. He wouldn't stop staring, and I stared back and tried to shake my grandmother awake. I started noticing other things about him, 
Like how large and cone-like his head was and how hairless and shriveled he looked as he stood still, surprised I could see him. My grandmother woke up, looked towards the door, and was gone. In the weeks leading up to this encounter, I had been experiencing strange things in my house, like my bedroom door slamming and locking on its own. One night I woke up to what felt like several hands touching my feet and legs and horrible nightmares. After the experience with this strange grey man, I told my parents, and they had my room exorcised. I'd give an exorcism really made those horrible things stop or gave me peace of mind from things I was manifesting myself. All I know is that I don't experience those things anymore, and I'll never sleep with a door open again. My grandfather's company, which does timber and mining, was setting up an office in a relatively remote part of a third world country and found a house that was dirt cheap, even for third world country standards. Obviously, there was a catch. The villagers in that area told him not to purchase it since the house was haunted and everyone who had ever lived there died violently. He decided it was just some superstitious BS and got it anyway. So the guy setting up the office will live on the top floor of the house with his family, and the lower floors for the office. He moved in with his wife and three kids. Anyway, my grandfather suddenly got no news from him for the longest time. Since this was in a remote part of a third world country, he wasn't too worried since he just assumed they lost power or something. He finally contacted the local police to go check on the guy since he was completely unreachable. They found everyone dead. Apparently the guy killed his wife, kids, and then himself with a machete. Yes, not a gun. A fucking machete. He actually hacked himself to death. It wasn't one of those cuts on the wrists that let everyone slowly bleed to death. Everyone was hacked down, including the guy himself. The description of the scene had to be an exaggeration since I'm assuming the sight of five decapitated bodies, including three kids, was scary enough to make people see things, so I won't bother putting it here since I'm not sure what's true and there were details that people could not have witnessed. Let's just say I stopped paying attention after I heard the phrase magic machete. I was told the entire room was covered in blood, including the ceiling. Some people were saying the blood on the ceiling had to have gotten there because the spirits threw the bodies around. I had to explain about blood pressure and got tons of weird looks. Now, the weird part, if this isn't weird enough, was that he managed to barricade the door with the bed, with his wife and kids on it. And it's one of those gigantic old beds that's extremely hard to move. The locals say this is evidence he was possessed by spirits. I say moving to the middle of nowhere in some third world country drove the guy nuts, and crazy people can do all sorts of crazy shit and even perform crazy feats of strength. Anyway, my grandfather had to pay a few bribes to make sure nothing gets to the press, not hard, middle of nowhere, about the entire thing and get the police to classify the deaths as natural, no idea how they'll explain that, third world countries are awesome. All employees in the know had to sign an NDA too. He then tried getting other volunteers to set up the office. Even if they haven't heard all the gory details because of my grandfather's gag order, everyone knows the previous guy died. No one volunteered. He promoted one guy, gave him a fancy title, and told him he's in charge of setting up that office. The guy quit. When I was about 13 or 14, I lived on a farm in North Carolina. This wasn't a regular farm that you would expect with fields full of beans and shit, it was actually a pine tree harvestery. Pine needles are a big landscaping commodity, so we lived basically in the woods and would bale out the pine straw every year. Whatever, the point is that my house was in the middle of 550 acres of perfectly lined longleaf pines. My living room had a huge picture window. I won't go into the architecture of the house, but it was a weird custom job built by some dentist in the 30s. The window in the living room stretched nearly the entire length of the room, maybe 50 feet. The house was built on a subtle hill, so the living room itself sat 5 or 6 feet off the ground, so you had something of an angle to look out at a solid mile of pine trees. During the winter, it was unsettling because you'd get just a bit of snow, enough to reflect moonlight so that you could see the dogs running around at night. I'll be honest, I hated that room and that window. So now to the relevant part, I had a cousin over for the weekend, and we were doing what kids do in the country, throwing stuff in the fireplace to see what happens. It is getting late and the fire is dying down, so we build the big kingdom of couch cushions and blankets in the living room and get ready for bed. Nothing is out of the ordinary until we hear the dogs barking. They were really far away. The property stretches for nearly a mile, so I just assumed they were chasing off whatever animal felt like shitting in my yard. So my cousin is staring out the window and not saying anything, which prompts the standard what's up. He just kind of keeps staring and says he feels like he's seeing things. Naturally, I get all anxious and start staring out the window as well. Nothing happens for a few minutes, and he gets more and more annoyed with me because I'm asking what he saw, he keeps shushing me so that he can focus. 
And then we both see it. A shadow of a person moves from one tree to the next. Not a run, not a leap, just a brisk walk from one tree to another. This is probably 100 yards out from the house. We can't actually tell if the person is coming closer or not because we're dealing with moonlight reflecting off of snow, slush, or ice. I guess the crazy part is that we didn't freak out so much, because at this point there is still that chance that we didn't see what we saw, you know? So we just kept staring. We should have gone to wake up my dad, but he's an idiot and the kind of guy to walk out on the patio and holler into the woods with his rifle. We were just scared enough to agree that we don't want to taunt whatever is happening. So about three minutes later, it happens again, but a good 50 feet from where we first saw it. Another person, another tree, a few strides, and they were gone. This happened every few minutes for the next half hour, and we just stared. At this point, I should mention that I didn't really have neighbors. The land surrounding our farm was federal paper, I don't know who owns it now, so there were miles and miles of uncultivated trees. You don't see people around the farm unless they intend to be there. So we keep watching as these two figures intermittently appear and vanish until finally we see one appear, but not disappear. Instead, we focus on it and see that it is now running forward. We lose our SHT and go wake my dad. By the time we get into the room with my half-awake father, there is no one to be seen. We sprint around, locking doors and windows. Keep in mind that we're out in the country with no one around. It rarely occurs to lock doors. Every door was worse than the last because you just know that as soon as you reach the door, someone is going to be trying to open it, although that never happened. We locked everything up, walked around the house at least 50 times, making sure no one got in without us knowing and then convinced my dad to fall asleep in the living room with us while we stared out the window. I never understood why my dad wouldn't call the police. He always had this we take care of our own mentality, and it simply wasn't an option to call 911. The next day we went out to look, and, absolutely, there were footprints everywhere in the snow. We saw them between trees, and then we finally saw where someone had been standing right in front of the window. But as I said, I wouldn't have seen them because, while I'm seven feet up in the living room, they would have been right beneath me. I have a fear of spiders because of a hunting trip I took with my dad and family when I was a kid. I don't enjoy shooting things, I'm not an animal rights activist, but I think killing for game or bragging rights and not for food is wasteful and barbaric. I had brought my game boy, and they stationed me at one of the ground blinds so I could use the radio to tell the others if I saw any deer headed their way. I got bored as shit and got tired of grinding in Pokemon, so I turned off my game and started rifling through my backpack to find another. As I did this, I heard a strange whooshing sound that sounded very close, but I couldn't find anything. I walked around outside the blind, and as I came around the backside, I saw that the entire outer wall was covered in a mass of fucking interlinked daddy long leg spiders. I considered running like hell, but I had no idea where the camp was, I had been driven out to the blind. My solution was to use my kind of off and the lighter from my backpack to blowtorch all the spiders off. Because stupid, that's why. The plan backfired because I made the mistake of standing downwind of the spiders. The second the fire hit them, they all let go and flew at me. The entire wall of them. Flaming, flying spiders. I immediately started screaming and rolling around on the ground. I took off all of my clothes and immediately called my dad on the radio and told him to come get me and that we were going home. I have never sworn or cried so profusely in my life. I eventually went through therapy regarding this event, and now I just hate spiders in general and prefer not to be around them. About four years ago, I woke up one late morning on a day off at 1021. You'll learn why I remember this four years later in a second. I got out of bed, used the restroom, got dressed, etc. I went back into my room and picked up my phone to check for messages, and the clock on the phone said 1025. I was surprised, because I know that it did not take me only four minutes to dress, I'd lingered in the warm bathroom quite a while and brushed my teeth too, etc. I looked at my bedroom alarm clock to confirm, since that was the clock I'd looked at when I woke up. It also said 1025. I shrugged it off and figured, in my sleepy, just woke up state, I'd misread the original 1021. I went downstairs, turned on the PC, turned on the news on the TV to listen to, and started cooking breakfast. I wanted to microwave up some rice leftovers from last night, so I went to pop them in the microwave. The time on the microwave was 10.25. I whipped out my phone to check the time, and it still said 10.25. There was no way. There was no way that I checked the clock upstairs, walked downstairs, turned on the PC and the TV, got a glass of water, and started cooking eggs in the matter of less than a minute. I decided to stand there and watch the microwave clock while counting to 60. I figured if it didn't turn to 10.26 in 60 seconds or less, 
Clearly it was malfunctioning. It turned to 1026 about 20 seconds into my count, which made sense, it had been 1025 for a while before I looked. I finished making my breakfast, plated it up, and took it over to the PC like the lonely slob I am. The time on the PC said 1020. I pulled out my phone. My phone also said 1020. That's when I started writing all this crap down. I pulled up the little clock toolbar and watched the second hand go around. While I watched it, time seemed to pass normally. It ticked to 1021 and 1022 as I watched the second hand go around. Over the next what felt like an hour or so, maybe an hour and a half, all the clocks in my house, as well as internet ones, seemed to pass time normally while I observed them. But if I looked away for a while, at least two minutes or so, they'd make no sense. At one point, about 15 minutes after these events, the cell phone and PC read 1014. Then later, 1013. Then back into the 10 colon 20s. After the hour and a half, they normalized, and I've never experienced it since. I was running my cable route in the inner city, and between jobs, I realized I had to shit. Now. Unfortunately, the nearest quick trip is like 5 miles away, tilde 3.67 light years in city travel, so I gamble and hit the nearest gas station. I get there, and of course there's a line to the one unisex bathroom. A dude, a chick, and myself are hanging around making small talk, but mentally, I am an absolute shit-squeezing wreck. After about 5 minutes, the dude goes into full-on rage or panic and starts trying to rip the door open, making the most demonic screeches. The woman in the bathroom is freaking out, the chick next to me is freaking out, and just as I step in to give him a WTF BRO. It was like he got hit with a jolt of electricity and fell. Lucky for me, I caught him, but at this point, I realize he's having a seizure. I cannot describe the feeling I felt looking into this gentleman's eyes, crying blood, foaming at the mouth, and flailing about the fact that I was just having a conversation with him. The elderly woman in the restroom happens to be a retired nurse, go figure, and promptly instructs bystanders and me on how to handle the situation, and the paramedics arrive toward the end of his fit. It turns out his alcoholism was linked with his epilepsy or some shit, and he was waiting in line to sneak a swig of the flask into his coat pocket. Info from his wife, I never would have expected it, dude seemed cool as fuck, well dressed, and groomed all that jazz. The ordeal ends, and I tell the woman it's her turn to use the restroom, to which she declines, being freaked out. I, however, drop the most contemplated and beautiful deuce in the dirtiest bathroom in the metro area. Maybe it's not that scary, but seizures scare the brother-loving piss out of me, and I think some people's personal lives are too much for me. This is one of two insane instances where I happen to be in the right, wrong, place at the right time due to minor or unusual route delays. While I was deployed in Kosovo, my team did a lot of night missions that required us to cover a great deal of ground in a short period of time in order to make our extractions, all of it while remaining undetected by anyone in the areas that we would pass through. We would always seem to see odd things during the night, but nothing like this. During one of our recon missions, we started by getting dropped off in a remote location to identify whether shipments of mortar rounds and mines were being moved through the area. Our extract was going to be before daybreak, and we needed to make it just over 17 kilometers. The terrain wasn't too overgrown, and we had good intel over the area, and it was either a full moon or close to it, of course it would be for this story, so unless we encountered somebody, this was going to be an easy night. Our team was normally only four men, but we had the opportunity to make this a good training run for some of the new guys, and we took on an extra three. We still wanted to make sure we played it safe, though, so I took rear security and, we'll call him L, took the position just in front of me. We both worked great together and could easily manage to cover our team if needed. We moved about 10,000 people through our mission area without finding anything and had a good time doing it. At this point, we needed to start heading for our extraction point, which was located over a good-sized hill and then through an area that was near a village, but not too close. We regrouped, did a count of people, ammo, and supplies, and moved out. Being rear security, I was the last to move, and just as I was about to take off, I heard a noise in the trees, maybe 50 meters off. I turned and saw L looking in the direction as well, he had heard it too. Everyone else was still moving, since the new guys were in the middle and were not used to looking back every 20 meters to spot your security. We were getting left. Chances were that the noise was nothing more than a deer, but L and I started moving out, using a two-man bounding technique. We kept hearing a noise, so I told L to reach the team while I remained in place after our next bound. I found a place with cover, and he bolted after the team. I heard the noise again and then saw trees move about 15 meters in front of me. Everything stopped. Two minutes went by with me being very quiet, controlling my breathing, 
and watching my front and sides. Al and my team were slowly making their way to engage whatever had been following us. They came up on the sides and surrounded the area I signaled to. Once in position, I moved up. Nothing, not footprints, tracks, or any sign that something had been there. Cue the guys giving Al and me a hard time for getting left alone and scared, good-hearted fun, of course, we moved out again. Again, I am the last to move, with L between myself and the next man to the front. This time, there are no noises when I step away. After about 2k, we come up with an orchard that we need to move through. The light from the moon was really bright, and the trees were spaced, so we used them for cover as we stayed near the middle of the orchard. Just before I enter, I hear the noise again. This time, I thought I heard a little girl giggling. Not something that my imagination would make up on its own. I was expecting wildlife, if anything. This time, L had taken off an additional 20 meters and turned to wait for me. I moved to my location, and he moved out again. I was crouched next to a tree, watching for anything. All of a sudden, the tree I was next to caught my attention. In the knots on the tree, I could see a face that looked like a person. As I squinted and looked more closely, a little girl's face appeared, and she turned at me, smiling, waving a little hand, and giggled, not maliciously, then disappeared back into the tree. I am in absolute shock at this point, and there is not a chance in hell that I am going back to my team to report what I just saw. So instead, I bolt and catch up to L and keep my mouth shut. Recognizing that I have likely lost my mind, I am not going to talk about anything. We hit our extract and left. Two weeks go by, and I am told that I am needed to provide security for a team of combat engineers who are going through an area I am familiar with. In the meantime, my team was going to be going through the area we were in two weeks ago where L and I got scared, everyone laughing. Again, I never said a word to anyone about what I saw. In my mind, I am quite happy about not going back there. So, I go out with the engineers and help them find a minefield that had been recently laid, in an area that kids walk through every day, and they take care of informing the village nearby while starting to blow the mines in place. I really appreciate the engineers and the work they did out there. I get back and am taken to see my commander, who says thanks for the work. Feeling great, I head back to my barracks room, a place I rarely get to visit, and see that none of the guys are back yet. No sooner than taking my boots off, the door opens, and I hear everyone laughing as they enter. L is not laughing and telling everyone to screw themselves. One of the other guys sees me and blurts out, Hey man. L says he isn't going on patrol with us anymore in your favorite spot. I just grimace and wait for stuff to calm down. A couple of days later, L and I are out playing babysitting for some scouts. He says, What did you see that night? I shrug and say, I don't know. Just my imagination getting the better of me. He then says something that sends chills up my spine, I know you saw her. I saw her too. Tell me I am not crazy. I felt numb and just said, you're not crazy. Where did you see her? He said, inside a tree. I had never given Laney NY Informatio about what I saw or details that could have led him to come up with the same conclusion. When I saw the girl in the tree, L was 40 meters away from my location and could not have even seen me looking at the tree. During the summer, when I was home from college, I worked with a couple of friends as a morning cleaner at the local movie theater. It was fairly new, built in the early 90s, with three big screen rooms, four mid-size screens, and three small screens. My job as morning cleaner was to clean all the screening rooms during a shift that went from 4 a.m. to 10 a.m. It would take me about 20 minutes to get to work from where I lived, the theater was out in an area that was kind of in the middle of nowhere. Before the area was renovated, we were told it was part wetland, part farmland, and the rest owned by the local nature center. The first couple of weeks that I worked there, nothing out of the ordinary happened. Typically, there would only be two or three of us working a shift. There was a lot of time spent by yourself, cleaning and listening to your iPod. Occasionally, we'd meet up with the day shift in the morning and give them a breakdown of the maintenance issues that we were dealing with and other things they'd like us to look at. One day in particular, my manager asked me if we had noticed the front doors being unlocked when we arrived in the morning. When I said no, the manager went on to tell me that customers, primarily women, were complaining about a tall, lanky man in a suit who had been following them from theater to theater and sometimes into the bathroom. Several times women had come to the front desk, frightened out of their minds, describing a seven-foot-tall man in a black suit, complete with a bowler cap, that walked slowly after them. A few times, even the police were called. Teenagers that worked the day shift referred to him as the tall man. While he primarily targeted women, occasionally a male co-worker would catch a glimpse of him sneaking into a theater. On a couple of occasions, they would pursue him, thinking it was someone trying to sneak into a movie, only to find nobody there. 
We had 12 theater rooms total, but theater 5 was the worst. Nobody wanted to clean out theater 5. When I first started, I was fairly naive about ghosts and spirits, and I didn't understand why even my boss was apprehensive about theater 5 and kept assigning me to be the one to clean it out. What made theater 5 unique was that it sat behind the bathrooms in the lobby, so to get to the sitting area, you had to walk down a long hallway before reaching the screening room. Being that far back, you were the most secluded, especially when it's 4 a.m. and the only other people you're with are on the other side of the building. People cleaning there would complain of nosebleeds, constant headaches, and a feeling of being watched. My first supernatural experience took place here. It was a normal morning, I had just finished sweeping out the lobby, and I was taking care of the cups and other garbage in Theater 5. By routine, you go through and throw away leftover cups and popcorn before vacuuming and sweeping the area. I had my iPod on, and as I was going through throwing cups away, I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was behind me. I kept turning around, even at some points taking out my earphones and shouting, Hello? Of course, there was nobody there. Like I said, it was a normal morning, and I had no reason to suspect anything. I went about my routine. About 20 minutes later, I'm at the top of the back row, sweeping out garbage from under the seats, when I hear footsteps. Someone running. I look down, and at the front of the theater, I catch a glimpse of a little blonde-haired boy turning the corner into the long hallway as he ran out of the theater. Immediately, I threw down my broom and chased after him. I ran down the hallway and out into the lobby, but there was no kid. I walked further into the lobby and saw my boss through the front entrance, on a smoke break. Who was that kid? I asked. My boss, Jeff, looked at me. For a moment, he was confused, but then he laughed. I'll never forget how casually he said it. So you met Charlie? Charlie was another thing customers constantly complained about. On several occasions, they claimed the little blonde-haired boy was running up and down the aisles in the theater, causing all kinds of noise and ruckus during the movie. Of course, it was in Theater 5. When an usher would come to apprehend the child, he would have already disappeared. The female staff affectionately named him Charlie after his resemblance to the character in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Charlie was also responsible for knocking several cans of garbage over, throwing papers around, misplacing things, and generally making being a morning cleaner a real pain in the butt. Charlie was more of a nuisance than anything. We used to theorize that he was the son of the tall man, but the two were never seen together. My only encounter with the tall man came a couple weeks after my run-in with Charlie. I had yet to hear about him at this point. Had I known, I most likely would have quit sooner rather than later. Usually in the morning, if you're the first to arrive, it's your job to walk up into the projector rooms and turn on the lights in all theaters. This is an easy task, except the top floor with the projects has a lot of life-size cutouts of movie characters and massive posters, and in the dark it can be a little creepy. I had done this several times before, and since I was the first to arrive, I went about turning all the lights on. The projector area itself is dark, typically, we'd carry a flashlight with us while going around flipping switches. That morning I couldn't find the flashlight, we'd later find it in the garbage, Charlie's fault, so I walked through the dark hallway of projectors, flipping all the switches. I had stayed up all night prior, watching the Andy Griffith show. I remember because I was whistling the theme song to myself as I walked down the corridor. Once again, I got that feeling of being watched, and something several yards away, in the area with the projectors overlooking the IMAX theater rooms, was staring back at me. I stopped whistling and tried to focus my eyes. It was a cardboard cutout. They were everywhere, so I kind of dismissed it and was about to flip the next switch when the cutout moved. I froze. What I thought was a cutout was actually a figure hunched over. Quietly, it was whistling the Andy Griffith theme song, imitating me, only doing it much more slowly. Slowly, it rose up from its crouch, revealing itself to be at least seven feet tall. It was a man. All I could see was a silhouette against the red exit sign lights and some of the projector computer monitors. It started toward me, whistling quietly. I wanted to move, but for some reason my feet were cemented in the spot, and I had cotton for a tongue. I didn't know what to do. Slowly, the tall man stepped toward me. He walked with a bit of a waddle, as if he had a bit of a limp in his left leg. I couldn't exactly tell. He had taken about three or four steps toward me when something caught his attention, and he turned and walked into an office down the hall. I turned back, ran down the steps, and waited outside the theater until my boss and the rest of the crew arrived. I told them what had happened, and they explained that the tall man existed, but he wasn't going to hurt me. I didn't care, that experience alone was enough to make me put in my two weeks. When I was 17, my dad moved into a new house, my parents are divorced and had been living apart for some years by now. Prior to this new home, 
He'd been buying relatively shitty homes that have fallen to decay, fixing them up, and selling or renting them out for a lot more money than they'd previously been worth. Anyway, this new house was no exception. It had previously been owned by an old woman who had died, and her family put the house on the market. Anyway, my dad moved in in the winter, and on one of his first weekends there, my two sisters and I stayed over. My sisters were in one room, my dad in another, and myself in my own. I had a hard time falling asleep and kept waking up on and off throughout the night. Every time I woke up, I heard what sounded like muffled voices talking in quiet conversation, it sounded a lot like a TV being played at next to nothing volume from a room next door. I assumed it was my sisters or my dad with a TV on because they too couldn't sleep. I thought nothing of it and eventually fell asleep. This happened for the next few nights we stayed there, and one morning while at breakfast, I asked my family if anyone had been watching TV late at night, as I'd heard noises. My dad and sisters both said no, but both said they'd both also heard noises and assumed it was one of us watching TV too. The next night, when my dad was home alone, he heard the noise and went to explore, no TV was turned on nor anything to be able to make those noises. Guests of his reported the same thing waking up in the middle of the night and hearing whispers, though thinking nothing of it. After a few months of this, my dad had to get surgery and was at home recuperating. He swears this is real, and I believe him, one night, he woke up at around 3 am to find a shadowy old woman standing next to his bed. She looked at him and said, you have a nice family, thank you for taking care of my home. She turned and walked away, making sounds that he said sounded like the whispers we'd been hearing. By the following night, the whispers had stopped and don't occur to this day. We later found a box of pictures in the attic from the previous family owners, and lo and behold, there are images of the woman who died, and there of the apparition my dad says he saw that one night. My junior year of college, I moved into a large house with four people on the first floor, five on the second, and two people upstairs who we didn't really talk to. The house was very old but seemed normal enough, until I went down to the basement for the first time. There was a washing machine and dryer that never worked, so we had no real reason to ever go down there except for parties. The weird part was this room towards the back of the basement that was always locked and just gave me an overwhelming sense of fear anytime I was down there. Well, apparently, when my roommates first moved in, that room wasn't locked. One of the girls was looking around and found several human teeth and what she described as strange tools. Not long after that, the landlord, who had only recently purchased the house, locked the door, and it was never opened again. Fast forward a few months. I had recently woken up from a nap and was cooking some food on the stove, and I was the only person on our floor. Suddenly the hallway light to my left turned off, and I just shrugged it off, assuming the light had burned out. Then it turned back on. The light switch for that light is in the stairwell on the other side of a closed door, so I waited a minute and the light turned off again. I quickly ran over to the door and opened it, thinking someone had to be fucking with me or something. No one is there. I walked downstairs, and there was nobody on that floor either. Now I'm a little freaked out, but I still just tell myself it must be an electrical problem. So I go back to my food. Immediately, the light goes on and off again. I just kind of stood there for a few seconds. Then the music started. It was coming from the living room, which is right next to the kitchen. Now I'm feeling relieved, thinking that someone is home after all. Walk into the living room, there is a closed laptop sitting on a ledge near the window connected to some speakers, and the television is on one of those static channels, just like in the fucking movies. I slowly walked towards the speakers when I realized the laptop wasn't even fucking on. I unplugged the speakers, and the music stopped. I really wish I could remember what song it was, but I had other thoughts on my mind at that point. That was when the chill sank in. I turned off the stove. I walked down the stairs, got in my car, and drove the fuck away. A few weeks later, I told my roommates what had happened, hoping that someone would confess to the very elaborate prank they had pulled. Instead, everyone got kind of quiet, and one by one, they each started admitting weird things that had happened to them. One of the girls said she would often wake up in the middle of the night and hear noises coming from her closet, and sometimes the hangers would be moving like something had just bumped them. Another friend said that he often heard noises, like footsteps above him, but when he walked upstairs, nobody was home. Another guy told us he had woken up in the middle of the night to see a dark figure standing in the middle of our kitchen, just staring into his room before it walked back towards the stairwell. Wendigo Psychosis when people go insane over long winter periods and turn cannibalistic for no determinable reason. The Wendigo is part of the traditional belief systems of various Algonquian-speaking tribes in the northern United States and Canada, most notably the Ojibwe and Salto, the Cree, the Nascapi, and the Inu people. 5. Although descriptions varied somewhat, 
Common to all these cultures was the conception of Wendigos as malevolent, cannibalistic, supernatural beings, manatus, of great spiritual power. 6. They were strongly associated with the winter, the north, and coldness, as well as with famine and starvation. One of the more famous cases of Wendigo psychosis reported involved a Plains Cree trapper from Alberta named Swift Runner. 21, 22, during the winter of 1878, Swift Runner and his family were starving, and his eldest son died. 25 miles away from emergency food supplies at a Hudson's Bay Company post, Swift Runner butchered and ate his wife and five remaining children. 23, given that he resorted to cannibalism so close to food supplies and that he killed and consumed the remains of all those present, it was revealed that Swift Runner's was not a case of pure cannibalism as a last resort to avoid starvation but rather of a man suffering from Wendigo psychosis. 23, he eventually confessed and was executed by authorities at Fort Saskatchewan. Another well-known case involving Wendigo psychosis was that of Jack Fiddler, an Ajikri chief and shaman known for his powers at defeating Wendigos. In some cases, this entailed euthanizing people suffering from Wendigo psychosis. As a result, in 1907, Fiddler and his brother Joseph were arrested by the Canadian authorities for murder. Jack committed suicide, but Joseph was tried and sentenced to life in prison. He ultimately was granted a pardon, but died three days later in jail before receiving the news of this pardon.